Right, so the final part of this lecture um, discusses the Fisher's exact test, which is also another method that's used for enrichment analysis. Um, in particular, this method is what we use in Enricher for enrichment analysis. Um, so an overview of Fisher's exact test. Essentially, this is a statistical test that determines if there is a significant relationship between two or more categorical variables. Um, it is a pretty common approach for quantifying overrepresentation between sets. So note that while a GSEA algorithm did require a ranked gene list as input, the Fisher's exact test works on an input gene set that's unranked. And then essentially for a given observed gene set, um, so that's the input query gene set, we want to identify if the input genes are overrepresented in some prior knowledge gene set. So Fisher's exact test is kind of built on this idea of contingency tables. So this is an example of a contingency table, a two category contingency table. So let, you have two different things that you're looking at. So you're looking at category X versus category Y, and you're also looking at trait one and trait two. And basically you want to see what the association is between both of these traits and these categories. So in this case, a null hypothesis would be that there is no association between the two categories. And this is actually also one of the assumptions in order to run Fisher's exact test. And then the second assumption is that the marginal values are fixed. So the total values in the columns and at the bottom of the rows, um, these are going to be remain the same for all of the different possibilities that you eventually will build from this table. And in order to actually calculate the uh, probability or the statistic for Fisher's exact test, there is this handy formula um, that looks complicated, but we'll simplify down eventually um, at the bottom. And if this all looks like a lot of letters and numbers, I think there will be, or there's going to be a more relevant example that I'll kind of run through this whole process with. So in the context of this course, let's say that we're looking at a gene expression signature that's derived from some drug perturbation. So here we're looking at two different traits. Um, so whether or not the, the differentially expressed genes from this drug perturbation signature, um, it, well, if they're differentially expressed or not differentially expressed, and then also whether or not those genes are in some pathway gene set or not in some pathway gene set. Um, and this will help us find out whether or not perhaps this drug is perturbing this specific pathway or the genes involved in this specific pathway. And let's say that in our data, we obtained these results. So we found 100 differentially expressed genes out of 10,000 total genes, which means 9,900 are not differentially expressed. And then of those differentially expressed genes, 80 of them are in the pathway gene set and 20 of them are not in the pathway gene set. Um, and you can fill in the rest of the table based on those numbers alone. So here we can kind of already see that given this example, if 80 out of the 100 differentially expressed genes are in the comparison gene set for the pathway, um, it seems like there is some association there just by looking at, at I. But however, what if there were only 50 that were in the comparison pathway set? would we still be able to confidently say that this drug significantly affects this pathway? And so basically we want to calculate the Fisher's, we want to compute the Fisher's exact test for this example. Um, and going back to those two assumptions I briefly talked about earlier, um, in the context of this example, the first assumption, which is that there's no association between the two variables, which is our null hypothesis, this uh, would basically mean that we're assuming that the differentially expressed genes and the drug perturbation signature are not associated with the pathway. And then again, the marginal values we also assume are fixed. So we are assuming that the true in the true results, 9,900 of the genes are not differentially expressed in our data, and it's true that 9,720 of the genes are also not associated with the pathway. 
So then um, if you were computing this by hand, uh, which I would not recommend, you basically would identify all the possibilities for the contingency table, keeping those two assumptions in mind. So basically you're not changing the row totals or the column totals, but you are changing the inner values. Note also that not all possibilities are equally likely. So think of how many ways that we could have one gene differentially expressed and also in the pathway set. Um, so it basically you could take every single gene um, that's differentially expressed and that could be the one gene that's differentially expressed and in the pathway set. So even though you're drawing out these tables as individual tables, um, the probability of obtaining each of these tables of result is going to be slightly different. So that's why you need this um, formula. And basically the logic behind the formula that I showed earlier is asking without replacement, how many ways are there to exactly see the data that we got? So how many ways are there to actually select 80 differentially expressed genes out of 280 that are in the pathway gene set? And then also how many ways are there to select 20 differentially expressed genes out of 9,720 that are not in the pathway gene set? And also, how many ways are there to actually select 100 different express genes out of the 10,000 total genes in the analysis itself? And so essentially, um, you can see that, that those questions I just asked are basically shown in this formula, and you can actually plug those numbers directly into the formula to kind of compute your statistic. And then finally, your statistic will essentially be the probability of observing this specific contingency table or these specific results out of all the possible results. However, it's important to know that even though we technically compute a probability, um, that probability is actually different from the significance of the result. Um, if we're looking at a one-sided hypothesis test, we're not looking just at how likely it is to see our singular result. We want to know how likely it is to see results at least as extreme as the results that we've obtained. So basically, in order to uh, compute the significance, we're going to sum the probabilities of the results that we observed. So that number that we just calculated, which corresponds to 80 genes that are differentially expressed and in the gene set, as well as all the probabilities of all the tables where more than 80 genes are differently expressed and in the gene set. Um, so in order to visualize this, you can kind of look at this hypergeometric probability distribution, P, um, or this probability distribution, and then P marks where our observed results fall, for example. And then here, the Y value is just the probability of obtaining the observed probability, which we have is P. But the P value for the significance is actually just summing the probabilities of obtaining the results that are at P and more extreme. So we're not just looking at where P falls, but we're looking at the area of this graph that's to the right of P in this case. If you're looking at a two-sided hypothesis test, um, this is usually computed by summing the probabilities for all tables or probabilities less than or equal to the observed table. Um, so you can kind of think of this as looking at now two ends of the graph. So you want to look at the example, all the probabilities that are at least as extreme as what we observe. And then also on the other hand, you want to find the another table with the same probability of P, of obtaining P, but in the opposite direction, and then sum those up. So in general, one thing that does need to be taken into consideration for Fisher's exact test um, is that low P values might occur by chance. This is known as a type one error, and the rate at which a type one error will occur is generally known as the false discovery rate. Um, and one issue with uh, multiple hypotheses testing, which is basically looking at multiple hypotheses at once, is that you increase the false discovery rate. So you increase the rate at which the type one error tends to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and logically, you can kind of think about how if you're comparing a single input gene list against a single gene set, um, 
you're less likely to find a significant association by random chance than if you're comparing that same input gene list against many, many different gene sets. It's possible that you're going to get a significant association um, at least once. Alternatively, but you can think about if you are just comparing or repeating the same experiment over and over again, the more times that you actually repeat the experiment, um, the more likely it is that you're going to find a significant association just by random chance. So because of that, you do need to have some sort of hypothesis correction method generally. Um, there are two main methods, um, both of which I've cited at the bottom. Um, you can also just uh, Google these and read more about them if you're interested in the math. Um, but the first is the Bonferroni correction. And this essentially kind of scales the significance level, which is your alpha, by the number of hypotheses tests. So I believe that you can get this new alpha level or significance level by just dividing your original alpha by the number of tests that you're actually running. And then additionally, the benjamini hochberg procedure is um, an adaptation of the Bonferroni method that actually accounts for the false discovery rate that you actually want to have. So in general, I believe the Bonferroni is a bit more stringent, but the and the benjamini hochberg um, is less stringent in the sense that I believe you will allow for more significant results to occur with the benjamini hochberg um, but if anyone has any specific questions, uh, I might also defer to Dr. Lockman, um, because this is a pretty complicated math. So in general, um, we kind of went over the Fisher's exact test, which is a method for computing overrepresentation between two sets, and it's also commonly used in gene set enrichment analysis. Fisher's exact test, as I mentioned, is the test that's used in Enricher. I believe Enricher also uses the benjamini hochberg correction, hypothesis correction method. Um, but Fisher's exact test is also implemented in several modern statistical packages. So if you're using R, the R stats package does have a Fisher test um, function. And then if you're in Python, the one that's generally used is the one from the SciPy package, which is just stats.fisherexact. And then for further reading, um, if you're interested in understanding more of Fisher's exact test, uh, you can refer to the Wikipedia page. Um, there's also a guide that walks you through it on the Pathway Commons website. And you can also look at the multiple comparisons Wikipedia page if you're interested in understanding why you need hypotheses correction. But in general, when you're just coding, um, you don't actually need to build all the contingency tables by hand. Those implementations will do most of the work for you. All right, um, so that brings me to the end of the full lecture. So once again, thank you to everyone in the lab for all their support and also thank you all for your attention.